Hey everybody, Brian Zane here with another classic pay-per-view review as nominated on by my Patreon backers. This week it's WWE Great American Bash 2004, submitted to me by Dylan King. Dylan, thanks so much for the suggestion. This show took place in Norfolk, Virginia on June 27, 2004. It's a SmackDown exclusive pay-per-view, the first Great American Bash since 2000 when WCW held the event. And considering what a wild, terrible year WCW had in 2000, I could only imagine this show will be at least marginally better than the last Great American Bash. The show begins with Tori Wilson, the poster girl for the event, in the middle of the ring, dressed as a sexy Uncle Sam, perhaps an Auntie Sam, welcoming everyone to Great American Bash. Michael Cole and Taz are at ringside doing announcing for the evening, and the opening contest is a U.S. Championship Four Corners Elimination Match. John Cena defending against Booker T, RVD, and Rene Dupree, Fiddly D. John Cena is a few months into his run as U.S. Champion here, and he is 100% babyface. There is no ambiguity, there is no dueling chance, no mixed reactions when he comes out. He is 100% full-on babyface here, beloved by all. It's crazy to think. You have to look back 13 years to find John Cena at a point where he was actually universally enjoyed by people before. He was shoved down everyone's throats and he won too much to the point of it being annoying. The reason this match is happening is because he's warring with uh, general manager Kurt Angle. Angle became general manager a couple months before this because he broke his neck in his match with Eddie Guerrero and this is their way of keeping him on TV while he recovers from that. So he's the GM here. He's a heel. He doesn't like how John Cena is represented Representing America as a champion, so he wants to get the belt off him. He's been trying all these different ways on SmackDown to get the belts off of Cena, having a fight Rene Dupree a lot and Booker T and RVD. In fact, actually a week or two before this match happened, Cena fought all three men in individual singles matches with five minute limits on SmackDown and won all of them and no one hated him for it. That was amazing. He could win three matches in one night and people weren't pissed. It's amazing. 20, uh, 2004, everyone. Something about this match caught me off guard when I watched it. Now, normally when you watch, you know, multi-man matches, three, four-man matches, the bulk of the work happens in the middle of the ring between like two guys and then the third and fourth man are on the outside selling injuries and they took a big move and they powdered and they're just kind of laying out on the ground waiting for their next cue. Uh, you don't get a lot of that in this match. When it's all four guys in the ring before the eliminations start happening, usually you'll see two guys in the ring and the other two are just standing out there waiting. Like they're just kind of, they're being patient, they're being strategic. And so on that level, it seems smart of them to do that, but it's a lot of just like time of them just standing in front of the camera, not doing anything. It's not a very good look. It does. It kind of takes your attention away from the action in the ring. It makes it less engaging. I think that would not fly today. You never see that happen in multi-man matches today. Rene Dupree is definitely the workhorse in this match. Before he gets eliminated, he is doing the bulk of the work on the inside. He's going one-on-one -on -one with Cena, one-on-one -on -one with RVD. He is working his butt off in this match. RVD hits Dupree and Booker T with consecutive five-star frog splashes one after the other. And just as he finished the second one, John Cena rolls up RVD because he's selling those ribs after taking two big splashes. And RVD is the first one eliminated. So you have this two-on-one situation where Dupree and Booker T are heels going two-on-one against John Cena. The, ali the alignment between the two quickly dissolves. Cena hits Dupree with the FU back when it was a reference to Lesnar's F5 and before they called the attitude adjustment. Then Booker hits Cena immediately with an axe kick. Booker goes to pin Renee. Dupree is eliminated, so you're down to Cena and Booker T in the final two of this match. Really cool counter by Booker T here. He's thrown to the corner. He has a cool roll-up counter out of whatever move Cena was going to do there. He hits Cena with a side kick, goes for the axe kick, but Cena gets out of the way, hits him with the FU, and one, two, three. John Cena retains, having uh, eliminated Booker T and RVD, and he's the last man standing in this match. He stands tall as the U.S. champion. A pretty entertaining way to start the show. I'm going to give it three stars out of four, except for the weird diversion where, you know, a couple of the guys are just chilling outside the ring waiting for their spot. I think it was a very good showcase by all four individuals. I think of those four guys, I feel bad for Rene Dupree. I feel like he didn't get a fair shake of the company. He had a great look. Uh, he had a good start with La Resistance. Then he was doing his own thing in the singles run on SmackDown with Fifi every week. But I think the big turning point for his career was the fact that he never got a leg up on John Cena. They fought a lot during this time period, and he like never, ever, ever won. You know, and they fought a lot for the title. John Cena always retained. I feel that if, if, if Dupree had gotten at least one or two key wins over John Cena, maybe things could have been different. This is the first time I started to notice, hey, maybe Cena is winning a little too much to the detriment of other storylines. But, you know, that, it never really occurred to me that the worst was yet to come. After the match, Cena makes his way through the curtain and goes backstage. He starts flirting with Miss Jackie right in front of Charlie Haas, who apparently doesn't seem to mind. As Cena walks off, Angle wheels in. And I say wheels in because several weeks before this on SmackDown, he was chokeslammed off a massive balcony or platform by the Big Show who was in the middle of a big giant rage. He was threatening to hurt Tori Wilson, but 
angle, makes the save, takes the bullet for her, gets chokes him off the platform, and you hear this big splat on the ground after he lands, and it's off camera. The camera pans back down to him, and he's like knocked out, his head is bleeding profusely, his legs all mangled and broken. It's a really gnarly way to write somebody into a wheelchair angle, but there you go. Angle berates Charlie Haas, he says he's gone soft. You used to be my protege and team angle, I used to respect you then, but you've gone soft. I'm gonna put you in a match right now against my new protege, Luther Reigns. And as soon as he said Luther Reigns, I went, oh no, not Luther Reigns. In another backstage vignette, we see Sable, Brock Lesnar's future wife, in a hot tub. She says throughout the night, the divas of SmackDown will be interviewing the wrestlers about the show, but for now, she's going to interview the biggest star in WWE herself. And she basically cuts a quick promo saying she's going to beat Tori Wilson later in the night because no one looks better in red, white, and blue than Sable. Okay. Charlie Haas taking on Luther Reigns, that impromptu match made moments before. Luther is wheeling Kurt Angle out to ringside in the wheelchair. Taz is on commentary during this with Kurt's injury, quote, he may never wrestle again, which with the power of hindsight is hilarious to think about. Uh, interesting note about Angle's wheelchair. It's got the American colors on it, red, white, and blue. So from one angle, you can look at and see red, white, and blue. But from the angle that uh, his body is not obscuring because he's sitting on the back of the wheelchair, it's the French flag. I don't know how anyone didn't notice that. The bulk of the match is spent with Luther punishing Charlie Haas in the ring while Miss Jackie's on the outside willing the fans over to his side. Charlie does make a brief comeback hitting Luther with a German suplex at one point. He goes for a big running attack into the corner but Luther gets out of the way. Charlie bangs his shoulder into the uh, corner post. Luther hits a twisting neckbreaker on Charlie to win the match and earn Kurt Angle's love and admiration and approval. I'm going to give this match one and a half stars. You know, it's nothing too special. It's kind of a big squash with Luther Reigns here and just the idea that the company would hitch their wagon to someone like Luther Reigns isn't very surprising because they always loved hosses. And this is right in the middle of time when like John Laurinaitis has taken over as, as the VP of talent relations. And that was the whole thing. There was a, Briefly, there was a height requirement in WWE. You must be this tall to apply as a wrestler. That was like Johnny Ace's, one of his big mandates early on. But that's neither here nor there. But the whole idea that the character of Kurt Angle, this wrestling machine, would ever hitch his wagon to a big hoss like Luther Reigns, who is like the CAW hoss version of a wrestler, in my opinion, would, is laughable. Cruiserweight Championship on the line as Rey Mysterio defends against Chavo Guerrero in a continuous of their long storied rivalry going back years in WCW to this point here in WWE. It's so funny to think that in two years from now, Mysterio will have graduated from the Cruiserweight division and is now will be a heavyweight champion and a heavyweight contender. It's funny how wrestling works. Chavo won this match by competing in a 10-man battle royal on SmackDown to become the number one contender. Early in the match, they are fighting on the top rope area and Chavo knocks Rey Mysterio off uh, onto the floor and Rey's knee buckles and it makes me think of that line, I've had five surgeries in my left knee. Chavo spends the bulk of the match working Rey Mysterio's leg, taking out the vertical base and the high-flying ability of Mysterio. At one point, Rey is like, hanging off the ropes on the inside. Chavo punts Rey in the leg, and he does a backflip sell. I love that spot. Chavo puts Rey in the stretch muffler for a long time. He puts him in a lot of different leg holds, and Rey's selling of this is just magnificent. The way he's just in such agony over his knee pain, because you know how, you know, there's at least part of it that's got to be kind of a shoot because of how many surgeries he's had in that left knee. So for him to have all these holds applied to him, it just makes it feel so much more like he just the passion he has to try to fight his way out of it. You can just really feel it and see it in his face and everything. Ray does start mounting a comeback. He does go to the top rope and dives onto Chavo onto the floor, which is pretty spectacular. At one point, they're both on the top turnbuckle again, and they both come down at the same time with a double face buster move as they're double down. It's great stuff. Ray hits Chavo with an enziguri into a 619 attempt, but Chavo catches him and puts him in a half crab, and for the longest, most excruciating time, he's in this half crab. Ray is just fighting tooth and nail to get out. Eventually, he hits the rope break. Chavo goes to hit the second gory bomb of the match, but somehow, I don't know how they pulled this off. Ray miraculously counters it into a code red to win the match and retain the championship. This was one of my favorite matches of the night. I give it four stars. It was entertaining from start to finish. Really awesome work by Mysterio and Chavo while they still have a lot of years left on them. Great workers. We've seen them work time and time again over the years. And this, to my, in my opinion, was one of the best showings I've seen yet from these guys. More fun to be had in the Great American Hot Tub. You have Tori Wilson sharing the tub with Billy Kidman, Spike Dudley, and Funaki. The three men are arguing over who would have beat Mysterio instead of Chavo Guerrero, and then Tori Wilson just stands up and gets ready for a match, and everyone's Auga! This is where the show begins to take a turn for the worse, because the first two out of three matches were fine. You've got, you know, the opening match, the U.S. title, that was great. You've got the Luther Reigns, Charlie Haas matches, eh, whatever, and then you've got the amazing Cruiserweight Championship match, Guerrero Mysterio. Then the shit train rolls into the station with Kenzo Suzuki taking on Billy Gunn in singles action. This is a rematch from the previous week on SmackDown when Gunn had Suzuki beat after a shit-looking Famouser, then Hiroko Suzuki 
Suzuki's manager and real life wife, threw salt into Billy Gunn's eyes to disqualify him. So this is a rematch of that. Suzuki debuted just a few weeks before on SmackDown. Of course, this is the second version of the character because originally he was supposed to be Hirohito, the Japanese nationalist, still holding a grudge from World War II. But now he's just Kenzo Suzuki here. He's the bronze warrior. This is the time in his career in the company where he still comes out coming on the big throne carried by the local workers. After a while, they ditched that element of his gimmick. I couldn't help but notice a sign on the hard cam that was prevalent not only in this match, but also in the matches before and afterward that read overused Billy Dunn, which I guess is this guy's attempt to try and take a stab at badass Billy Gunn. Sick burn there, kid. Uh, Kenzo's gimmick here, he's a slow, lumbering martial arts expert. He like They can't make up their mind of what discipline he is. Is he Aikido, Judo, Muay Thai? He does nerve holes, he does kicks, he just kind of stands around and is like, this thing, he has the kind of like lumbering look with his arms and everything. It's a really, they don't know what to do with him at this point. He's just basically slow, generic looking Japanese man. Uh, and of course, combined with Billy Gunn, who is an okay worker, but I mean, I don't think their styles meshed very well. The match ends when the referee gets turned around. Suzuki low blows Gunn, hits him with a terrible looking backbreaker to win the match and continue his winning ways. I give this match one and a half stars. There wasn't much to this match. I didn't care for the clashing of styles between these two. It didn't work out for me. And it's just, you know, I, I don't get what they're doing with Kenzo at this point. I don't think they ever did throughout the whole thing. It wasn't long after this, they had him team with Rene Dupree and he was doing the whole God Bless America thing. And he was doing his French tickler dance with Rene Dupree and they were tag champs. It just seems like a weird kind of consolation prize for both those guys. Now that I think about it, Dupree and Suzuki, this unlikely team that became champions. So after that masterpiece, we then get in singles action, Sable, Taking on Tori Wilson. Yeah. Two women who are just renowned for their wrestling acumen in the, in, the, in, the, in the wrestling ring. Sable, of course, was one of the biggest names of the Attitude Era. She was like the top female draw and pretty much right on par with guys like Austin and Rock in terms of drawing power of merchandise sales, even though she was a charisma vacuum. She left the company in 1999. She sued them for $110 million over a sexual harassment claim, which was later settled out of court. The fact that she's back at all in 2003 is a huge shock to me. But she comes back there, she's an integral part of the Vince Stephanie McMahon feud, you know, that would led to the infamous I Quit match, which I talked about in my top eight worst Vince McMahon countdown many years ago. But she's still around in 2004. She and Tori Wilson actually team up for a while. They are co cover girls in Playboy that year. They team up for a bit over that. They split eventually because uh, Sable is jealous that Tori Wilson is the poster girl for Great American Bash 2004. How dare she? If you're looking for fantastic wrestling action in this match, you're not going to get a lot of it because Sable's offense isn't very good and Tori's is not much better. Tori hits an ugly sunset flip on Sable at one point in the match. The double down comes when both of them collide heads coming out of the corner and you know they're down for a while. Tori is the first to get up and she's ready to fight but Sable's still down, still selling the head injury. She hasn't really moved. The referee's checking on her to make sure she's not hurt. Tori spends a lot of time just looking off at something. I don't know what it is, but Sable is playing possum. She gets up, rolls up Tori Wilson and keeps rolling her to the point where the shoulder's not even down anymore. Like it's a very bad pinfall. The referee's looking right at it, but he doesn't give a shit. He just counts the three. You know, there's a handful of tights, shoulders up. It's a very ugly pin, a very ugly win for Sable. And unbelievably, they did a rematch for this on SmackDown later that week. I don't know about that match on SmackDown, but I'm going to give this one a half star rating out of four. It's not even worth a full star. Why do they even have these two women wrestling? In a match game. I can understand Tori going against like, a competent actual female wrestler or Sable going against one, one on one. They could be carried. But to have two women who aren't wrestlers wrestling in a match, it's just crazy to think of how far we've come in the women's division. And also, it's a very big dichotomy between Raw and SmackDown at this point because Raw is clearly like, you know, they're the entertainment show and SmackDown is the wrestling show. But you have it flipped when it comes to the women because with the women of Raw, they're the workhorses. You've got like, you know, Molly Holly and Trish Stratus and Gail Kim and Victoria, all these actual women wrestlers and then over on Smackdown you have like Tori Wilson and Dawn Marie and Sable it's like wrestling what's that tee hee speaking of Dawn Marie we find her backstage interviewing Renee Dupree outside of the hot tub for some reason Renee's pissed about losing the uh, US championship match in the opener he starts to hit on Dawn Marie but then the full-blooded Italians Nunzio and John of the Bull steal his thunder and Nunzio puts over what big feet he has and you know what to say about guys with big feet and so he walks off with Dawn Marie John of the Bull then makes fun of Renee Dupree's shoe size before walking off which is ironic because in the shot where you see their feet, Johnny's feet are invisible because they're covered up by his pants. Up next, Mordecai, the Pale Rider, takes on Hardcore Holly in singles action. This is the second pay-per-view match for Mordecai. He debuted the previous month at Judgment Day against Scotty Tuhati in a big squash, and ever since then he's been squashing jobbers left and right. The 
actions that led to this particular match was a backstage brawl at SmackDown the week before between he and Hardcore Holly, and this is basically a continuation of that brawl. They're fighting for a while in the ring, they powder the outside, they lightly graze the big cru crucifix thing happening, the symbol as they might say. Mordecai puts Hardcore in a rear chin lock for it feels like a very long time. The fans are definitely getting restless at this point. Hardcore does make a comeback with some big clotheslines, followed by a flying elbow off the top rope. He goes for the Alabama slam, but in a counter I've never actually seen before. I thought it was actually a pretty cool way to get out of it. Mordecai slaps the sides of Hardcore Holly, and that causes Hardcore to like sell that. Mordecai recovers, hits Holly with the crucifix bomb, his version of the Razor's Edge, to win the match. I'm going to give it one and a half stars. And again, I hate grading all these matches so low, but that's just the trend of this show. So many of the mid-card matches are all these experimental matches with newcomers who are unproven and with weird gimmicks that aren't over going against people who are past their prime. It's just a really weird combination and you're seeing that time and time again uh, here in this show. It's not it's not pretty to look at with the exception of the matches I've already talked about. Interesting note about Mordecai here, this would be the last week he would be seen on the main roster with this gimmick. Uh, later in the week he'd fight Rey Mysterio on SmackDown, lose clean and that was his first and only loss as Mordecai. He'd be gone though. He would not be seen for another couple of years until he comes back as Kevin Thorne, the vampire on ECW with Ariel and all that stuff. But the reason he was taken off TV and I've gotten this wrong before in this show and I apologize, I want to get it, get it right now now, the reason he was taken off TV as Mordecai was because Kevin Fertig, the wrestler, got involved in a bar fight somewhere, and then the guy who was in the fight with saw he was a wrestler, thought he'd get some money out of him and WWE. He sued the company, or he threatened to sue the company at least. I don't know if the lawsuit ever actually reached anything beyond a settlement. So he sues the company, and because of that, there's too much heat on, on Mordecai. He's taken off TV, and that's the last we see him for a long time. But after all those crap matches, we're finally redeemed. WWE Championship match. Eddie Guerrero defends against John Bradshaw Layfield, JBL in a Texas bull rope match. I tell you, JBL debuted with this incarnation only about a month and a half before, maybe not even that much, because he wrestled Guerrero at Judgment Day for the title. He was thrown right into the main event scene after doing the APA stuff with Ron Simmons, and Simmons gets fired. JBL debuts. He's just this loud, arrogant, rich white man putting his thumb down on illegals and Mexicans in general, going against this Latin superstar, Eddie Guerrero. He's going to the Border Patrol, and he's kicking out Mexicans. He's giving Eddie Guerrero's mother a heart attack in El Paso. Just the nerve of this evil, evil man. I feel like we don't know now how good we had it with JBL as a character. Because, I mean, I was against JBL as well. I didn't like the fact that he was getting pushed to the top so soon, you know, with such a weird transition from, like, tag team guy to, like, boom, main event or new character. Put him in a suit and a cowboy hat and he's a WWE champion now. That really irked me a lot. And it's very similar to what I see a lot of the backlash with Jinder Mahal today. Obviously, there's some differences there and I'm not going to go into it now. But to me, it felt very similar as well as the backlash did back in 2004. But, man, what a good heel JBL was here because he was the right guy at the right place at the right time uh, all the social unrest with the legal immigration which of course is still going on today but like that's when it felt like it was really reaching this like zenith and JBL was just right on top of it doing the border patrol stuff getting a Mexican dude in the crowd to wash his car under a time limit like the million dollar man it was just brilliant stuff in hindsight these two had a championship match at judgment day the previous month it ended in a disqualification when Guerrero hit JBL with a chair but before that Guerrero was hit with a chair of his own and bled buckets. It's one of the most like horrifying but just awesome images in wrestling. It's just like Eddie Guerrero just covered in blood, bleeding all over the ring, holding the championship belt up in the air after the match ends in a DQ. Just gruesome stuff. Not so much blood in this match, the Texas bull rope match, but we still get some blood here. Uh, Tony Chimmel has to read the rules of the match on flashcards and he is flustered. It's just one of those things where it's like, if a match has that many difficult stipulations to explain, you might lose the fans over. But that being said, it was still a very good match. Very physical match. I love Love how you know they use the rope to choke each other out. Just using the rope as a weapon, but not the, ro the the rope doesn't get in the way of things. That's great. It's not like a hindrance to them. It's not a, it's a, it's a, it's not something that gets in their way. They use it to excel the match and add flavor and zest and make it so much better. I'm just gushing about this match because it's that good of a match. So many close call spots because you know the rule is you have to hit four turnbuckles in succession in order to win the match. And you know, if the momentum gets stopped, it gets waved off, and you have lights to signify who's touched what turnbuckles. And there's so many times where it's like three out of turnbuckles, three out of four turnbuckles touched and then like the guy's reaching for the fourth one just reaching out going for it all he can but like one of the others just blocking him like JBL's too heavy Eddie can't get to the fourth one JBL's going for the fourth one and Eddie's just clean to the ropes and JBL's throwing a shit bitch like, I want to touch that turnbuckle he's just so angry it's so great Eddie Guerrero gets payback from Judgment Day when he gets thrown to the outside of the ring hits JBL thwacks him right in the head with the most satisfying clat sound you've ever heard in your life Wait a minute. 
Eddie hits JBL with the three amigos, followed by the frog splash. They continue to fight in the corner. At one point, JBL grabs the cowbell portion of the rope, hits Eddie in the head with it, then beals him off the top rope onto the announce table outside. The table doesn't break. JBL hits him with a power bomb to finally break the table. The match is ending as both guys are touching each pad in succession. So Eddie touches one, JBL goes right after. Eddie touches one, JBL touches it right after until three of the four corners are lit for both guys. It's a tug of war spot over the fourth corner. Eddie jumps over JBL to touch the fourth corner. It lights up. The bell rings. The match is over. Eddie Guerrero seemingly retains the championship in a hard fought match. Or does he? Because as he's celebrating, Kurt Angle comes out to ringside and reverses the decision. Because if you look at the footage, you see JBL, his shoulder or his back, it makes contact with the turnbuckle pad before Eddie touches it. Amazing timing and coordination on the part of both these guys to make this work. So what happens is JBL, he's the one who touched the fourth corner before Eddie did. That makes him the new WWE Champion. How fitting is it that in the first Great American Bash since 2000 when WCW had it and the company went under, how fitting is it that this WWE Championship match ends in a dusty finish? Incredible match. It was great. There was emotion. There was struggle on both sides. It was just such a great story being told. I'm going to give this four stars out of four. Tremendous matchup here. Uh, this, of course, would be the end of Eddie Guerrero's one and only WWE Championship run. The beginning of JBL's one and only WWE Championship run. He would hold the belt for 10 months, which was a record at the time, one of the longest uh, reigns in the modern era before he'd be beat by John Cena at WrestleMania 21. Uh, you know, the thing with JBL, I have to go back on him and his, his heel character. I think a lot of fans today interpret, you know, if they don't like a wrestler or they don't like a gimmick, anytime they hear boos for that gimmick, they interpret that as go away heat. This was just as old school of a heel heat gimmick as you could get. Just a truly despicable heel getting booed. It wasn't go away heat. It was like, fuck this guy. He, we want to see him, see him get his ass kicked. And that, I think, is, I mean, I can't think of another heel character, at least in the last five years, that really fit that description. JBL was kind of like, again, right place, right time. It worked in hindsight. I don't know why I was so anti JBL as like the smart fan, but like I get it now. Main event time, the concrete crypt match as The Undertaker takes on the SmackDown Tag Team Champions, the Dudley Boys, in a handicap match. Where to begin with this? I guess you could begin with WrestleMania 20, when Paul Bearer made his long-awaited return to the company, coming out alongside The Undertaker, who was coming back as the Dead Man gimmick, and that cool entrance against Kane at 20. Uh, really cool moment to see Paul Bearer come back. You know, he's got the whole the makeup on, the urn and everything. It was a great little nostalgic act. They're together for a few months. Uh, while this is going on, Paul Heyman is trying to motivate the Dudley Boys to get more extreme, be more aggressive, you know, take control of their destiny. They take that to the extreme. They kidnap Paul Bearer. They stop them in a trunk, they drive off, and Paul Heyman procures Paul Bearer's urn. So now Heyman has a bargaining tool. He uses the urn as a method to bend the Undertaker to his whims. He makes him take the knee to Paul Heyman, so now he has all the power. So he's basically getting him to do his bidding. So now as part of this power play, Heyman demands Taker to do the right thing and lay down for the Dudley Boys at the Great American Bash and put a huge feather in the cap of the Dudleys and basically put them on legendary status for beating the Undertaker. Because if Taker does not do the right thing and does not lay down, then Paul Heyman Heyman will murder Paul Bearer on live television because he's got Paul Bearer uh, trapped in this glass case and there's a big cement truck right next to it and when Paul Heyman pulls a lever a bunch of wet cement's gonna dump in and encase Paul Bearer in the cement and will suffocate him and kill him and bury him alive in concrete in front of the world on pay-per-view. That's the whole basis of this match. Some blatant use of trick photography in this match because the live crowd, the guy they're seeing in the concrete crypt is not Paul Bearer. It is an obvious stunt double and anytime they show the actual Paul Bearer it's always on like a tight shot, some pre-recorded from earlier in the day. You don't see anyone else interacting with him. If you see Paul Heyman or later The Undertaker talking to Paul Bear in the crypt, you never see a two shot. You never see who they're actually talking to because they don't want to show you it's an obvious stunt double. And so they recorded all this stuff with Paul Bear earlier in the day and they have the stunt double stuff later on. You never even see close-ups of the fake Paul Bear's head until the concrete's all the way up to his neck and they only they show like the back of his head. You never see his face and like you'll see his face but it's from far away and it's very obvious it's not actually Paul Bear. It's pretty obvious what they're doing here and it's actually kind of makes everything hilarious. The match begins with Bubba Ray berating Taker on the mic, telling him to lay down and do the right thing. Taker starts laying down, Bubba stands over him and Taker grabs him by the throat and he starts fighting them and then Heyman goes, bad dog, bad dog, bad dog, bad dog, Undertaker! Bad dog, bad dog, bad dog, bad dog, bad dog, 
Basically, anytime the Undertaker shows a sign of restraint or fighting the Dudleys, Heyman pulls the lever and fills the concrete into the crypt. And of course, that's when they show the, the tight shots of Paul Bear. Again, the real Paul Bear getting the concrete filled on him. The match itself is nothing special. It's Taker versus the Dudleys in a handicap match. You can kind of play that out in your head, and it's pretty much what happened here. A very basic ending. Taker hits Bubba with the choke slam, hits Devon with the tombstone to win the match. Paul Heyman goes to pull the lever one last time to seal the deal, but Taker shoots some lightning out, scares Heyman away. Taker bows to Paul Bear. Then he gets to the mic and says, I have to do this. I have no choice. Rest in peace. Then he pulls the lever and drowns fake Paul Bear. And that's how the show ends. Someone getting killed live on air. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, I'm going to give this match two stars. Uh, in no way can it compare to the match preceding this, the JBL-Eddie Guerrero match. The story, far more interesting than the match itself. Uh, you know, it was what it was, and then you have Paul Bearer being suffocated on live television. Uh, they did say on commentary on SmackDown that week, say, well, Paul Bearer was extracted. He has severe internal injuries. We may never see this man again. And that's a lie, because he actually would come back years later, only to be hurt in more gruesome ways in the Edge-Kane rivalry. And also on SmackDown, we finally got an answer as to why Taker pulled the lever on his own manager and essentially killed him. Basically, he said that, you know, Paul Heyman exploited a weakness in Taker's game, and that was his, his emotions and his feelings for his friend, his confidant, Paul Bear. So Taker goes, if I could do that to the one person I cared about, imagine what I could do to you. So that sets him on a whole new path, you know, everything. So he basically, she, he, he basically sloughs off the old image, the old Taker with Paul Bear, and he's his own man now. So you can kind of see why he did that, but at the time he was just wake. Whoa, why'd he do that? Why He won the match, he kill, kills his own guy. I don't get it. And that was the Great American Bash 2004. I'm going to give this an overall grade of C+. I, in my opinion, the three championship matches, in particular, Cruiserweight and WWE title matches, were phenomenal. I would go out of my way to watch those two again. The U.S. title match, you know, not so much. It was still entertaining, but not on that level. But those three matches just really buoyed a woefully inept card. I mean, just think of the names here. Kenzo, Suzuki, Mordecai, Luther Reigns. Just like a who's who of some of like the blandest, worst gimmicks from Ruthless Aggression era you could possibly conjure up. Sable and Tori, that match didn't need to exist. Uh, the Concrete Crypt match, the match wasn't as good as the story being told, but I couldn't get over just the hokiness and just how obvious the trick photography was to get around the fact they couldn't really get Paul Bear to be in a Concrete Crypt live in front of the audience. Actually, really funny thing, if you actually go on YouTube and look up like rehearsal footage of the Concrete Crypt stuff. It's out there somewhere of Taker in the street clothes. The house lights are up. There's no audience there, and they're rehearsing like the lines and the blocking for the finale of the Concrete Crypt. It's just so cool to see like such behind the scenes stuff with someone as guarded as the Undertaker. Really cool stuff. I recommend you check that stuff out. So thanks once again to Dylan King for nominating this show for me to review. If you'd like to play a role in determining what classic shows I review in the future, go to Patreon.com/WrestlingWithRegret, become a $10 backer or above, and you will have the right to nominate shows for me to review on this segment in the future. Now, next time on Classic Pay-Per-View Reviews, we're still doing Great American Bash, but we're going back, back, way back to Great American Bash 1991. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, comment below, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.